Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... Welcome back to my holiday-themed book reviews. Before we get started, I know that Yule and Hanukkah have already begun, and I know later this week we're going to have Christmas and Kwanzaa, and no matter what you celebrate, I just hope that you have a great time celebrating it. I hope that you're surrounded by nothing but your loved ones, and you have just a wonderful time this year. Oh, Merry Christmas! Oh, thank you! Who's it from? From me and Sally. Oh, Sally. Oh, honey girl. Oh, you're such the sweetest little kitty in the whole wide world. Yes, you are. You got me a present. And I know it's not going to be one of those crappy books that I've got in the last two videos. Ooh. All right. Ah. Well, this is kind of small, but, oh, oh, it's, it's a little trinket owl. Now, I have this really good background story about owls because my grandfather and I, we just shared this bond over them. When I was a kid, I would sit on the front porch with him and he would like just hoot off to the owls and the owls would hoot back to him and they would kind of have like this little conversation. So this really means a lot to me. Well, it kind of... <laughs> Something smells fishy here. Yeah. Oh my god, it's a turd! What a look! What the hell? Sally! I can't believe that you conspired against me with him! And you! You... Oh, you asshole! Oh, God! I hate you! I hate this house! And I hate the holidays! This weekend, I'm reviewing The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, which is one of my favorite books. But before you think that it was always a favorite book, I would just like to note the first time I read this was in junior high and it was mandatory reading. And needless to say, I really did not enjoy it back then. It just seemed like it was a book that rambled and went nowhere and I did not give it my undivided attention. But as life continued, my attention span grew and also my comprehension skills uh, improved. And I really felt like I needed to give this book a second try. So a few years ago, I finally downloaded the audiobook of it. And by the way, the audiobook is narrated by Emma Thompson, and she does a superb job. She, she's just fantastic with it. But upon listening to the audio, I discovered that this was actually a pretty creepy book and there was one scene that was so frightening that even though I read it in the middle of daytime it still just creeped me out so I'm really glad I gave this a second try because it is now one of my favorite go-to's for the holiday season Turn of the Screw presents a nameless narrator who explains that he and his friends are sharing ghost stories on Christmas Eve, and among them is a man named Douglas who explains he has in his possession a manuscript that belonged to his little sister's governess from a long time ago. And since the governess has passed away, he feels that it's an okay time to share her story because it is quite a frightening story. And even though he doesn't have this manuscript on his person, he gives a little rundown of what everyone can expect, and once he sees their interest is piqued, he sends off for the manuscript and receives it shortly thereafter Christmas. From here, the story becomes nothing but the governess's perspective as it's told in first person, and what we learn is she's very young and this is her first job, and the reason why she's needed is because the children she's supposed to look over are actually orphans where their parents had died while they were on vacation, 
and in turn the two children were inherited by their uncle who has no interest whatsoever in being a parent. So while he's away at his own house, the children and all of his helpers are at the mansion called Bly and this is where the governess is supposed to take care of them and teach them and just make sure that they won't not. So when she arrives, she meets one of the maids named Miss Gross, which they become really close friends. And with Miss Gross, she first meets Flora. And the governess draws a quick assumption that this is the most beautiful girl she's ever seen. She's almost angelic. She's pure and innocent. And she just instantly falls in love with Flora. And not long after she's there, she learns that Miles is coming home indefinitely because he has been expelled from school. And she's really nervous to find out why he is expelled, so she kind of just sweeps that under the rug until a more important time. And she's a little worried that he's going to be the troublemaker, but then when he arrives, she sees that he is so sweet and innocent and handsome, there must have been a misunderstanding on why he was expelled. So, by the strict orders that she has not to bother the children's uncle whatsoever, she takes the two kids under her wing and nourishes them and helps them grow, and everything's moving smoothly until these two evil entities come on to Bly, and they start snooping around, and they start peeking around corners, and the governess soon learns that these two evil spirits are there to corrupt and damage the children so they will no longer be innocent. And now it is up to the governess to make sure that innocence is preserved. After Henry James's play Guy Domville was booed off stage, he left London to temporarily reside in Sussex. Here, he lived in Lamb House where he began writing Turn of the Screw. James explained he was inspired to write this classic due to an account told to him by Edward White Benson, the Archbishop of Canterbury. In this telling, James learned of two small children who were haunted by the ghost of two malevolent servants. Turn of the Screw first appeared in Collier's Weekly in 12 parts between January and April 1898. It later received publication as a whole in two collections, one in England and the other in America. Fun Facts because Henry James was such a popular and interesting author, there were a lot of speculations and conclusions that were drawn about his personal life that may or may not have been true. And since I was unable to find a definite yes or no, I just ended up picking out some fun facts here that could maybe pique your interest enough where you could research him a little bit more. Henry James's father was a believer of Swedenborgian mysticism. This was a belief system mixed of philosophy, theology, and spiritualism. So for Henry James, the paranormal wasn't too abnormal of a subject as he was growing up. As far as Turn of the Screw is concerned, James utilized the governess's characterization once again for the heroine in his story Covering End. The title Turn of the Screw means two things. One meaning is that it reflects how the governess feels she is turning the screw of human virtue. Another meaning is referenced when Douglas is discussing the manuscript. By the viewpoint shared among him and his friends, the title reflects a strengthening of tension. Before Henry James passed away, he had written over 100 short stories and novellas, not to mention 20 novels, plays, travel essays, and many book reviews. Now that we have that information out of the way, it's time that I move on to the spoiler section of this video, which this is going to be where I talk about some scenes and character development that I really adored, but at the same time, it could take away from the experience if you've never read this book. So if you wish to skip this chapter, just scroll down. You'll notice that I have a pinned comment at the top of all the other comments. And inside of that, there's a little timestamp that will redirect you to the thoughts section of this video. You only have 17 seconds to do this. So ready, set, go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now that everyone has had a chance to click away, I would like to discuss the scariest moment in this book. Now, throughout, there are quite a few creepy moments that are just subtle and they kind of just emerge out of nowhere. And because of how open and vague these moments are, it does kind of work on the chill factor. But the moment that is absolutely frightening is the one scene where the governess sees the ghost of Peter Quint on the stairwell. And truth be it, throughout the book, she sees both the ghost of Peter Quint and Miss Jessel about the total of eight times. And out of all of the times that she interacts with them, this by far is the scariest because it just feels so real. And the reason why I say that is because this is written in a first person perspective. So we get a deeper insight into the governess's emotions. And this allows us to be able to connect with her on a deeper level. Now, in this moment, we do have where the governess is on the staircase, and it's late at night, she's the only one who's awake, and bam, there's Peter Quint's ghost. And it's like she's caught as a deer in the headlights, or she's had a bucket of ice water just dumped on her, and she's just standing there in shock, and she can't believe her eyes because this is the first time she has been this close to the ghost. And the way that everything feels here, it's so tangible because if I was in her shoes, I would have the same freeze-up reaction. And what even makes this scene more intense is the idea that she uh, reasons that even if she had met a murderer at this hour, in this place, the murderer at least would have spoken to her, which this kind of paints the imagery that Peter Quint is more diabolic than a murderer. And it makes me wonder, what's worse than that? Now, the thing is, there's really no idea of how far Peter Quint can go beyond the human abilities because he is a spirit, but it allows the mind to wonder exactly how far will he go? And overall, no matter how many times I've read this book, this one scene still gives me the heebie-jeebies. Normally, I use this segment as an opportunity to be a smartass, but the characters are so well-crafted, there's not really anything for me to pick on. But I do want to use this opportunity to focus on the governess, because she is one of the most multi-layered characters ever put to literature, and every time I read this book, I have a different opinion about her. Like, the first time I read it, I felt like she was completely innocent, she did everything she could to save the children, and her intentions were good intentions. But the second time I read this, I felt like even though she might have still had those good intentions, she was insane, and the ghost never existed, and we were literally reading the rantings of a mad woman. The reason why I feel this way is because, first off, I want to note that this is a first-person perspective story. So we are receiving everything directly from the governess herself on what happened. My question is, should we trust the governess? I mean, this is some random person who is telling us about an account that she had with two ghosts on a property. And who's to say that she's not insane and we're receiving the thoughts of a person who might be delusional? Well, let's consider that the governess is in fact insane. She is the only person who ever sees the ghost. The kids never see the ghost. The help never sees the ghost. It is only her who is afflicted by the two spirits. And you might be like, well, okay, well, explain this then. When she went to Miss Gross about the strange man and the strange woman that she saw creeping around Bly, why did Miss Gross automatically say, oh, that is Peter Quinn and that is Miss Jessel. They're both dead. How was it that Miss Gross was able to quickly identify the people that the governess had been seeing? 
Well, truth be it, the governess only provides a vague description of both spirits. And the description is so vague, it reminds me almost of like how a con artist psychic might be in a room full of people where she's like, all right, I have a message for someone in here whose name starts with a J. And if the room is full of like anywhere from five to a hundred people, I'm sure someone in there is going to have a name that starts with a J. And I'm not saying that Miss Gross deliberately fed her this information, and I'm not saying that the governess deliberately decided that this was a good subject to run with and just create a fantasy world on. I honestly think that in this light of the governess being insane, she gave a vague description, Miss Gross jumped to a conclusion, and the governess's overworked, repressed mind just ran with it and made matters worse and just continued to imagine things going from one extreme to the next. Now, the reason why I say repressed is because she has led a sheltered life. And there's this one really twisted scene where the governess and Miles are left alone and you have where Flora and Miss Gross have left Bly. And the scene between the governess and Miles, it's subtle, but you see that it's very twisted because the governess compares this moment no differently than a bride and a groom on their wedding night. Now, what's twisted about this is Miles is a child. He's not even reached puberty yet, and the governess is in her 20s. So I have to think, what person in their right mind would look at a child in this romanticized light? Definitely not a person who was sane, that's for sure. But if we were to consider that she was insane, Miles's death is all her fault. Even though she might not have intended for Miles to die, that's exactly what happened. And the thing is, Miles gets frightened to death right after she goes on one of her long rants about how the ghost of Peter Quint is in the house with him and they have to face Peter Quint so that they can stand up to him and say, no, we will not allow you to corrupt us. We will not allow this. And it's so intense that when Miles turns and sees whatever is there, if there is anything there, he automatically is frightened to death by the suggestive thought. Okay, so there's what happens in the circumstance that the governess is insane. So now let's flip the coin and see what might would have happened if the governess is a sane individual. Okay, so still, the governess is the only person who can see the ghost, but in this scenario, the ghosts do exist. So she's done everything possible to protect the children. And she's doing everything that she knows to do to stand her ground and to make sure that the children are never corrupted by these spirits. But she does see where corruption is starting to seep in. And she steps in there to try to cut it off. And she tries to get Miles to confront the ghost with her so that the ghost will no longer afflict him. And in turning to do this, he gets frightened to death. Okay, the death isn't her fault, and she did everything she knew to protect Miles. But since the concept of the ghosts being at Bly are to corrupt the children who are purely innocent, perhaps the children were not the target of the ghost. I mean, you have the governess who has led a sheltered life and she honestly hasn't done anything evil or bad that we know of. And so perhaps the ghosts are there to corrupt her, where in turn she will corrupt the children. And this is a possibility because it brings back into play that moment where she's with Miles and she's considering this being no differently than a bride and groom on their wedding night. Okay, for that corruptible thought, perhaps that was actually the ghosts that were influencing her to have that thought. So, possibility. But if you've read this book 
and you would like to throw in your two cents worth on if you think the governess was sane or insane, I welcome you to do so in the comments. But please, anything that you decide to comment on that would be a spoiler, please note in your comment that this is a spoiler. Because if no one has read this book before, we don't want to ruin it for them. After I had reread this book a few years ago and discovered I loved it, I sought out the many different movie adaptations that have been spawned from this work. And truth be it, there's over 20 adaptations, not to mention the new adaptation that's coming out, which is a modernized version of this work called The Turning, which it kind of looks like in the trailer that this is going to be an amped up version of what James wrote about. And it seems like it's going to have a lot of gimmick scares. But I'm still going to see it because I'm a fan of the work and I just really want to see if it's good or not. But out of the versions I've seen this far, my favorite one, if you're curious, is the one that has Lynn Redgrave in it. I highly recommend that one. A follow-up would be The Innocence that has Deborah Kerr in it. That was a good adaptation as well. Now, on to the book itself. With The Turn of the Screw, it is very thought-provoking, and James writes it with such an openness that it really allows the reader to be a judge, and the governess is the one who's on trial here. And it's something where it causes us to question, should we really trust one person's account for what happened? How reliable is this individual? And so it kind of works in a sense where if maybe you're already a skeptic, you would think, okay, the governess was insane. But if you do believe in spirits and ghosts, you might believe, yes, the ghost existed. So the way that James just openly teeters on a line here between do they exist or do they not exist, it's really something that's fun to bring up in discussions, especially in book groups that might be reading this. That's a really fun debate to have. Now, aside from that, the book does focus on the subjects of repression and the corruption of innocence. And I really can't elaborate on that here without giving away spoilers. And also I discussed these topics in the spoilers section already. So you'll just have to take my word for it that these subjects do come into play quite a bit and they're very heavy throughout the book. This book is not for everyone. And the reason why I say this is because of the verbiage in which it is written. And for a younger person, they may very well feel like they need a dictionary in order to be able to comprehend some of this. And for them, it could just become too tangled, especially with the ranting that's in here. But even though there is quite a bit of ranting and rambling, I kind of feel that's part of the charm of this book, especially on an intensity level that the governess presents us. So if you are looking to enjoy some turn-of-the-century writing this holiday season, this would be an ideal read. And there are some scary scenes in this. So if you're looking for subtle scares, this is ideal. It's not anything that's explicit. It's just a good creep factor. And it's a book that I continue to return to because I feel like there are so many different layers to it, especially with the character development. So... Considering the fact that I enjoy this, I would recommend it to anyone who is looking for a heavy read. And it's weird that I say this, and I said something similar with The Woman in Black. As you can see, this is a thin book, but it is a very heavy, thought-provoking read. So this is something that you would not want to read after you finish just reading this four or 500-page epic and you need something light. This is not a light book. But if you're looking for something that's a good conversation starter and something that just really shows what gothic horror literature is, this is an ideal read. On to the questions. The first question I have is, since Turn of the Screw presents some children that are innocent and described as angelic, 
they are still somewhat kind of creepy. And because of this, I'm looking for other book recommendations that have creepy children or a creepy child. And I don't mind if this is supernatural based or if the kid is a serial killer. Anything that has a creepy kid in it, load up my comments with those book suggestions. Now, on to the second question. The second question is, do you and your family tell ghost stories on Christmas or Christmas Eve? If so, what are those stories? Unfortunately, I did not grow up with that because my parents were just kind of oblivious to there being ghost stories connected with the time of the year. And so because of that, the closest that we get to ghost stories on Christmas or Christmas Eve is like watching Scrooged with Bill Murray or A Christmas Carol with George C. Scott. And um, sadly, there's nothing more to elaborate on. But uh, with all that covered, it is now time to move on to the end of the video. And this is where I would like to thank Joseph Baylot for contributing to my Patreon account. Thank you so much for doing that. If you would like to contribute as well, the link to my Patreon is in the description section of this video. And if you do contribute, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos. If you can't contribute, no sweat whatsoever. I do these videos just for fun. And with the money that I get from Patreon, I just turn around and use that for marketing or maybe some extra props or some new books to review. And uh, also, if you would like to find me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, the links for all of those are going to be in the description section as well. And before I head out, just be sure to click that notifications bell and hit subscribe because I do have tons of more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great holiday, no matter what holiday that is. I hope it's wonderful for you and sweet nightmares.